So hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's discovery uh, session. Um, I'm Natalie Owen, Director of Stakeholder Engagement here at Efficiency Canada. Um, I hope everyone's having a fantastic week and uh, fantastic, fantastic month and year. It's uh, still 2021. Yes, the session is recorded. Uh, so before we get started here, um, I'm just going to welcome our uh, speakers for today. We have CIET is joining us to talk about their Energy Management 101 training that they are giving us a little teaser uh, for those that are interested. We thought it would be a great idea for them to come. We have Stephen Dixon as well as uh, Olivier Capon. So welcome, uh, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for joining us this week. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Natalie. So, Stephen, maybe you can um, uh, help me by advancing a couple of the slides until we get to your part. Um, but uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's Olivia Kappen here. Uh, thanks to uh, Natalie for the invitation. Very happy to take part in the Discover uh, Energy Efficiency sessions. Um, what we'd like to do is uh, give you a bit of a teaser as to uh, what we do in the EMP 101 program. Uh, Stephen and I have given this program about, um, I think I've lost track, Stephen, but I want to say four times. Yeah, um, that's good. That's about right, right? Okay, so about four times um, uh, with our next session coming up in March. And um, so, Stephen, if I can just get the next slide. What we'd like to do is just tell you a bit about uh, the program. Like I said, give you a little teaser and Stephen actually even has a, a little demo that he'll bring you through that we'll, uh, we'll attempt to do live. So uh, that, should be, uh, that should be a lot of fun. And then of course, we look forward to taking your questions at the end. Uh, so a bit about the program. I won't spend too much time on, on the nuts and bolts of the program. You can, of course, uh, check it out on the website. Uh, but in essence, uh, we launched this program in April of 2020. Um, specifically looking to to see how CI, uh, how we could do more essentially to get um, uh, new Canadians um, students just graduating so basically new professionals to the to, to the energy efficiency job market and also to uh, those looking to uh, further their career uh, in energy efficiency to really give them uh, a, a holistic but also a pragmatic, uh, level of knowledge that they could use um, and that they could demonstrate to uh, to a prospective employer um, or to the employer that they already have that would that would that would allow them to to, to go further in their career. So that is the idea behind it. Um, people tend to be using it for two reasons. One is, uh, as we said, to have some tangible skills when they go into uh, uh, into the field. And the other is, um, for those that are a bit more seasoned, uh, to use it as a stepping stone for the, uh, the Certified Energy Manager uh, program, which uh, does tend to uh, require a certain level of um, of, of previous experience uh, and knowledge. Yeah. On that one, Olivier, I've had a number of people um, say to me when I was delivering dollars to cents workshops um, and the spot the energy savings they would say to me I wish I had I had this workshop before I did my CEM so a yeah. lot of what we've incorporated <laughs> into the EMP 101 comes from the dollars to cents spot the energy savings yeah and I think it, Stephen you'd probably agree that it, it gives them a, 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 a better background as it pertains to all the calculations and and some of the the methodologies that go into uh, and, into something like a CEM yeah, absolutely. And we, we try to make it as real and practical as possible. And you'll see some of that today. So Stephen, can I get the next slide? So when uh, when Stephen and I were designing this course, essentially, we were we were trying to, as best we could make, think of all the things that make up energy management, uh, and try to essentially come up with um, uh, a bit of a journey uh, that we would bring people whereby we essentially would start with the fundamentals of, uh, of, of what it is, of what energy management is and, and what you need to understand in order to, uh, you know, to get involved in energy management. So that's what we typically do on the first day. And then we really get down to um, the energy consuming systems. What are the specific things that people will need to be aware of in order to make a difference, especially obviously in a, in a, in a, in a commercial context, but in all sorts of, uh, in all sorts of uh, buildings and facilities and uh, programs. And then the third is probably uh, day three is probably my favorite day. 
which is, you know, so you've, you've, you've got your fundamental understanding of energy efficiency, you've got your understanding of energy consuming systems. Uh, now, what do you do with that? So how do you actually apply that into uh, a real life setting? Um, and of course, how do you then bring others along uh, and engage them? And so, Stephen, I guess we should say that we, this is not pie in the sky. We didn't uh, get this off the top of our head. We, uh, Stephen, if I can get the next slide, we sort of oriented ourselves from um, this idea of the challenge of energy management as uh, comprising three, um, a triumvirate, if you will, of, of, of three things. So you've got the technical side, which for us is, is our day two. You've got the organizational side, um, which is uh, largely our day one. And then, of course, you've got uh, people's behavior, um, which is which is a bit of what we attack in in, in day three, and um, it should be said that these are not really new concepts. I think uh, Stephen, you were telling me the first time that you came across this kind of idea was in in 1999, right? That's right. Um, under the dollars to cents program, one of the first workshops was created. We we had uh, sort of we were introduced to this. I think Robert Greenwald, who's online, was also there too. We were introduced to this this Venn diagram, which uh, was for me sort of, it kind of formalized what I'd been kind of seeing before. In fact, two years prior to that, I ran into a, I worked with a social anthropologist in PEI. She was actually in charge of the energy program down in Prince Edward Island. And one day she said to me, she said, Steve, you technical guys are never gonna crack this energy nut until you deal with people and then groups of people. Who better than a social anthropologist to focus you on the importance of people. And that's truly then where I, this kind of all came together for me in, in the last century and we took it forward. So ultimately, you know, when it comes to um, doing things that are technical, there's both operational and technological things. One thing I would realized over the years, it isn't just about uh, changing a light bulb. It isn't just about putting in a variable speed drive. It's how we use the light bulb, how we use that switch, how we use that drive. So it's both operational and technological. And you can appreciate then there's a different cost attached to those things as well. Ultimately, if we're talking about operational things, we have to focus on people's behavior. I don't like to use the word behavior. I like to actually talk about awareness, engagement, habits, procedures, and feedback. You know, it's very difficult to not get a speeding ticket when you don't have a speedometer in your car. And the same thing without good energy information, people are, are you know, they can have great awareness and great habits, work with procedures, but they need feedback too. All those elements are important. And then ultimately, if you're dealing with more than one person, you're dealing with organization and that culture piece comes in. And we, we deal with all of these things. We actually even have an activity around organizational culture as it pertains to energy efficiency within day three of EMP. So it's a very holistic view as, as uh, Olivier has talked to you about. And we cover all these, these things all the way through. This is sort of a, the overarching theme behind it. Um, the one thing we also look at is coming out of a report back in uh, about 10 years ago, the seven habits of highly efficient companies. And there's 28 different elements to this, but this is, it's a really, really powerful way to think about what it is to be a, a highly efficient company. Given the time today, I'm not gonna read all these things. You can read the slides. I actually direct you to the reference. It's a great report that was behind this. They looked at hundred companies, companies like Toyota and 3M and so on that did this stuff. What did they do? Right? How did they do it? And, and you know, one of the things that stood out to me in all of this was the first one on the list. A lot of times people put leadership and support and commitment up there, and it's all also up the list, but efficiency is a core strategy. Most of these companies made efficiency right, part of their core business strategy to make them more profitable. What better way to embed efficiency into things to make it persistent and, and ongoing? So have a look at that. We we'll definitely cover it in the workshop, but the reference at the bottom there will help. You can just Google that one too. You'll probably find it as well. Day one is about fundamentals, right? There we take a look at, you know, the, the units of energy and, and the relationship between cost and energy and carbon. I, I like this slide. I always like to tell people to do this. If you've got an organization, you're managing energy, take a look at your costs and you'll discover your, your cost pie chart has one characteristic. In this case, here in our jurisdiction in Ontario, electricity is a huge proportion of the cost. If you look at your energy consumption, it probably breaks down 50-50. If you take a look at your carbon side of it, again, here in our jurisdiction, it's gonna be different from all of you across the country. Carbon is, is a much larger piece of the pie. So if we have the challenge of going forward, we've got the sustainability goals, i.e. carbon, we have fiscal goals, right, i.e. money, we've gotta balance these things. So looking at it this way allows us to do that and understand what we do, which meets both of those, those goals that most organizations have today. 
You know, we make sure that we understand, you know, we try to demystify this too. A lot of people really, I think, overcomplicate the carbon thing. There's some pretty, it's actually e easier to calculate the carbon impact of an, a change in energy than it is, I think, cost sometimes, right? The factors are straightforward, right? It, it does get complicated in, in certain ways, but it can be kept very simple. We use tools like actually Red Screen, which it makes it very simple. If you calculate a savings, you get the carbon impact right away. You get the cost impact right away. An idea is great. An idea with carbon and dollar values attached to it is fantastic. Let's make those ideas mobile and, and appealing to everybody. We get down to simple things. I find people abuse the word efficiency. For me, the word efficiency means what you got for what you bought, what you get out for what you put in. And ultimately the formula is here, you know, and, 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 and let's bring it down to very simple things. So we try to understand through a number of practical demonstrations in the workshop, one of which I'll demonstrate to you in a few minutes, ultimately what, what this efficiency thing is all about. But it isn't just about efficiency, right? It isn't just about efficiency. It turns out it's, a, it's about more than that. So when we start to look at systems, we introduce a methodology for understanding where the opportunities lie within systems. And, and what this comes down to is the idea that we first have to understand how a system, whether it be a, a building, a plant, you know, a city for that matter, or maybe it's just an energy consuming system in your facility, we can apply this methodology at any scale, any scope. But ultimately, we first priority is understand how it uses energy today and then find out what we can do to improve that. So our seven steps methodology, and this comes from an audit methodology I've used for 40 years, right? Understand your consumption and cost. Compare yourself, benchmarking, right? Compare yourself to yourself and others. So doing the monitoring thing as well, performance analysis, understand when, profiles of electricity, gas, understanding right on a time scale, very powerful tool time series analysis, we get into that, we give people tools for this and understand where it's all going, building that inventory, understanding what the pie chart looks like. You know, if I only had to do one thing, one half of this process, I would always do the first part because I can always find opportunities by asking myself those questions or those going through those first four steps. But now I have an opportunity to look for more savings and I do it by looking for waste, energy we don't need to use, maximizing efficiency, right? How well we convert the energy, what you got for what you bought, but the waste is the first priority and then ultimately supply. Now think about net zero. How do you get to net zero? Well, you get the waste out first, you improve the efficiency and then you turn to the things that optimize supply like heat recovery and renewables. And if you do things in that order, you will find the most cost-effective solution. So ultimately that's a strong theme throughout the second day. That is the methodology for looking for opportunities within systems and equipment and buildings. We should say, Stephen, that ultimately that methodology will underpin a lot of a lot of what people will will, will do in their um, in their careers. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you can apply that method. We didn't get it from energy. I was standing in a plant one day, yeah. and and my my friend Garth, who some of you know, Garth White, I worked with for years. He looked over on the wall, and there was this this graphic around how to eliminate waste, material waste, in a production environment. And Garth and I both looked at this, and we go, we can apply that to energy. So that was actually a company called Granville Castings up in eastern Ontario. And, you know, they taught us how to manage energy, right? We took the principles of materials management and waste reduction, lean, a little bit of lean in there, brought it into energy. So ultimately, it starts with understanding what your need is. Energy you don't need to use is beyond what your defined need is. Even today, when you're looking at taking a building to operating under COVID, one of the things you have to do is understand your current facility requirements. What do you need? And how's that impacted by COVID? So ultimately it comes back to the need. Starting with the need is always the place you start when looking for opportunities. That way you never compromise the need, right? And you meet it as effectively and as efficiently and as wastelessly as possible. And we can define needs in many different ways, but key thing is to measure it and document it. So we focus on that type of approach to looking at systems. I've got a little treat for us today. This is actually a demonstration activity uh, that we used in the workshop, but rather than just showing you a static slide, I'm gonna show you how we actually do this online in the workshop. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna take down my um, slides, you can't see that yet, and I'm gonna bring up the spreadsheet and the, um, the actual demonstration here. We're gonna go through a physical demonstration. So, uh, Olivia, you can confirm this. Uh, you can now see my background, which is a bit of a yep. sunset, maybe, with some pictures yep. on top of it, right? And we've got the Excel as well, and the image. Yep. So we're Great. Good to go. So over here, I can wave to you now. You can see me. And Ellie says I can't use cameras, but I snuck my camera in here. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so I can do this little pumping. This is a real pumping system, right? We've got a pump over here, right? We have a, a, a loop. Which this is running about five to eight gallons a minute. One inch pipe, pretty good. Pressure gauges. When we get into the details of these systems, we might use the pressure gauges. 
Today, we're just going to use our little flow meter over here, right? And we're going to use our pump here. We've got a, a multi-speed pump. And we're going to try and experiment with it. We'll see what it look, runs like under different conditions. And we'll see which is the best conditions to run it. This is the technological aspect. OK, so I'm going to turn on my pumping system here. And hopefully, we'll see on the screen. There we go. It gets a bit noisy here. But you can see my flow meter. As I did that, my flow meter right here is a little plunger, right? It went up to full flow. So I'm running at eight gallons a minute. Right, and I'm going to wait for the system to stabilize. And I can, I used to do this with a flip chart and write it on the flip chart. And Robert Greenwald used to help me do that times, right, when we did workshops. Well, ultimately, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hit a button which says report, and it's going to grab grab the value from my electronic meter, which is metering this by my network here. So there's 44 watts, 5.6 watt per gallon per minute. All right, let's do the thing that many people do. That's about the best thing to do. We're going to throttle this thing down, and we're going to throttle it down to five gallons a minute. There we go. So we're at five gallons a minute, right? And whoa, look at that. We saved a bit of energy. Well, not very much, or a little bit of power, not very much. Hmm. Look what happened to our watts per GPM. We're, at, we're using a lot more power for the amount of flow we're getting. Okay, let's go further. Because my ultimate goal is this system was way oversized. We only needed two gallons a minute. Okay, let's get to two gallons a minute, right? So I'm going to set that. There we go. We're now at two gallons a minute. Somebody can keep me honest by looking at that. Okay, well, we saved a little bit more. Oops, I did that wrong. <laughs> so let's go back here, 44.1, right? Or 44.4, hit the wrong button here, folks. This is real, Natalie, you told me I had to keep it real. So, and then we got 43.5 here, right? So if I hit the clear button, it's, it's a problem. Okay, so there we go, 40, and maybe we'll look at that. Now we're even up to uh, 44.5. So. One way or the other, going to two gallons a minute by throttling is not a good plan. All right, let's see what a better plan is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to full speed. All right, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take advantage of the pump that I have here. You know what, I've seen these pumps installed in buildings, right, all like this, and they've got all this speed control. This one looks pretty cool. It has some built-in intelligence to find the right operating point. And what people do is put a throttling valve right beside it on a hydronic system. What a waste, what a waste, let's see how much. Okay, so I'm gonna slow this thing down now, right, to, to a lower speed, and you'll see that my flow meter settles in here at the five gallons a minute now. Okay, that's good, so I'm gonna hit the right button this time. All right, so 21.6 watts. Already, we're using less watts per gallon per minute than we were to begin with, right? Right to begin with. Now, let's see if we can go further. So I'm gonna drop this thing right down right, to its lowest speed. And we see our flow meter settle in here at two gallons a minute. You know, it, it actually has a watt meter and a flow meter on this pump, but you can't read that very easily. But it is sitting there at two gallons a minute. I'm gonna record the wattage. Look at that, 6.2 watts. So which way would you rather run your pump, right? In for 22 watt, 0.2 watts per GPM or 3.1, wow, seven to one ratio. Now, if you know anything about pumps and pump dynamics, and we'll learn about it in the course, the, the um, pump affinity laws, you'll see that there's a, there's a reason for the ratio being close to eight to one. And that, that's because of the theories behind it or the, the actual uh, relationships behind it. But we don't have to understand all those numbers because that's the other virtue of this course. You can, you can kind of be an observer and watch stuff like this, or you can be, I've had people go through the course that were like 15 years in mechanical engineering and they got something out of the course too. Right, so it's, it's got something for everybody and it allows us to work at a number of different levels using techniques like this. So um, hopefully we'll be able to share a few more of those things with you. I'm just gonna shut the toys down now and I'll bring my slides back up. Actually, as I do this, I'll just share with you a little beautiful view from PEI. If anybody knows what this, this is a sand dune in the North Shore of PEI. And this very, very smooth angle is called the angle of repose of a particulate in a pile, like an aggregate, like sand. It's beautiful picture, but it's also beautiful science as well. Okay, so let's keep going. We're, uh, we're getting close on our time here. So I'm going to go back and I'm just gonna say a few words about how we apply what we've learned now within our workshop. So under application, one of the things in terms of um, methodology for finding opportunities that we actually uh, focus on is the idea of existing building commissioning. And we get right into the, the, the techniques of it. We have activities within the workshop that explore how to do this. Now, we're not going to make recommissioning or a building commissioning professionals in this workshop, but we will provide a platform that they can then go and take some of the other courses that are available out there for becoming more proficient in that. 
right? So we go through and, and we break it down and we demonstrate some of these techniques within the workshop using things like loggers. In fact, we can run functional tests potentially on a pumping system in our workshop as well. So we, again, we're trying to make this stuff as real as possible, right? And, and that's ultimately, uh, there's only one way to assess the system. Ultimately, we can sit there at the end of a computer and look at it on the automation, but any good existing building um, commissioning professional will tell you the best way to do it is to walk, put your boots on the ground and go look at that system. And again, that's how we try to bring it as much as reality as possible in these workshops. All right, so an idea that saves energy is a good thing. An idea where we know how much energy it saves, <clears throat> excuse me, we know how much cost reduction we get, we know how much carbon we get is a good thing. But what about the business case behind it? Well, in this workshop, we do a couple of things that are pretty cool. We answer this question full on because these two projects on the base of simple payback look the same, but I don't like that word simple payback. I would rather talk about net present value. Well, no, I'd rather talk about savings to investment ratio, whereas simple payback is how long do I have to wait to get my money back? Savings to investment ratio says, if I give you a certain amount of money, how much are you going to give me back, right, over, uh, over a certain period of time? So if I say over 10 years, you know, a simple payback of three years is, could be like a savings to investment ratio of four to one, meaning I get four times as much money back. And that's adjusted for things like inflation and discounting. That is the time value of money. So ultimately, we, we teach really good financial analysis. We provide some pretty good tools for that, too. We have a financial analysis spreadsheet. So not only do we give people knowledge in this workshop and hopefully through excitement, we build some motivation for them that, that is allowing them to feel motivated to do this. We give the real tools to apply, <clears throat> excuse me, because without the tools, all the motivation in the world and all the knowledge is not as useful. So tools are important too. We should say Stephen, that those, Stephen, we should say that those tools are both technical and financial. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Technical and financial. And in fact, even more than that, because when we go beyond the whole idea of building or just the financial case, we go to the idea of building a business case around efficiency. Then we use a technique called the one page proposal. Anybody have ever seen it? It's a great book. Look it up if you haven't called the one page proposal written by a guy named Patrick Riley, but we build it into the workshop. And I've had people run away and get so excited about it and actually go away and send me an email three days after the workshop said, Steve, I took that one page proposal idea. My boss was telling me the proposal I was giving, it was too long. This was from selling projects internally. He said, she, she said, I, I went back, I spent a bit of time. I got it to one page using your template and he approved the project for $140,000. In fact, now we want to find more of them. So ultimately these are real tools that work for people, right? And this, this, actually, this slide, actually, some of you might recognize it if you've ever gone through the older Dollars to Cents workshop. Well, we've incorporated the best of Dollars to Cents within these workshops, and this is one example of that. So I'm going to flip it back to you, uh, Olivier, and I'd be happy to answer questions as uh, we finish off here. Thank you very much, Stephen. So, Natalie, um, I think uh, I, was, I was trying to follow the chat, but I think there's a couple of questions that we might have missed. So, um, yeah, if yeah. you want to fire those at us, we're happy to take them. Perfect. Thank you for uh, bringing your enthusiasm today. And also, I appreciate that there were some rules that I had that you followed, Stephen, and then some that you didn't. <laughs> Actually, that's true, Natalie. We, we, we still owe you a joke, Stephen. You have to think of a good joke. We were instructed to, to yeah. be funny. <laughs> oh. oh, that God. was your job, Olivia. <laughs> uh, I'll think of something along the way. I've got, I've got a few minutes. You know why I don't tell jokes? Because my wife tells me that if I tell a joke and you laugh in the audience, I might think I'm funny and I might do it again. So that's my joke. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well done. Uh, she smells, sounds like a smart lady. <laughs> yes. So again, one of the questions was, is this session being recorded? So yes, it is. Um, we're going to post it on our, our website uh, along with the, all the other ones. It's under the education tab on our website. You'll find all of them there. Uh, another question here, which I saw that uh, Matthew Cote, who works uh, with uh, these two here, has answered, but um, so I'm going to read it if that's okay. So the question is, is this course suitable for business development roles too, without having any uh, energy efficiency or engineering background? Do you guys want to address that? And yeah, yeah, sure. I'll take that one, uh, Stephen. Um, yeah, I would say absolutely it is. Um, uh, you know, in, in designing the course, we're actually matching somebody that's non-technical myself with somebody that has a lot of, you know, over 40 years of technical experience. Uh, well, Stephen, I'm going to say 40 years. I think it's around there, um, yeah. which, which, which is Stephen. And uh, so I think uh, even if you're, you've got a non-technical background, 
um, that is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to both expose you to the technical in, in, in an amount that you can, that, that, that is palatable to you, but also to, to, to develop the skills that you do have. I think I did see that question. I think the person had a business development background. So I definitely think that um, that application and what we were talking about, the, about the one page proposal, I think all of those things will be uh, uh, of a lot of interest. And then conversely, a lot of people that have that, that systems, that technical background, um, Stephen was talking about mechanical engineers, often um, either the, uh, the, the, the application and how to engage others, there's always something that you can learn uh, there to kind of get the most out of your technical skills by bringing other people in on, onto, the, um, on, onto that energy efficiency journey with you, because ultimately you'll need people. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to reinforce that. We definitely can uh, appeal to all people. One of the design um, premises that I started with in, back in 1991 when I designed the uh, the uh, what became the Dollar to Cent Spot Energy Savings Opportunities Workshop it was actually uh, called the PowerWise Opportunities Workshop with the government of PEI was the idea that you need two people in the room. Now, today we can't be in the room, but we can be online. And those two people were somebody in a decision-making capacity in an organization who, who wouldn't necessarily understand or want to deal with the technical aspect. And we had the technical people who were in the operational role. And one of my goals, and I actually had people saying this in the workshop, was there to be a dialogue between those two people. So the person that's in the decision-making capacity is not going to make a decision positively towards doing something for efficiency unless they have a level of comfort with what they're hearing. And so this workshop isn't designed to necessarily make them into that practitioner, but it allows them to understand and participate in the discussion and become comfortable with the terminology and that the technology is real. We try to keep it as real as possible. So in that way, you know, and in the online environment, we've had that too, people in the room, like it's not just me, right? It's people with the 15 years of experience in this workshop, along with somebody who's brand new or maybe doesn't have a technical background. And through that conversation, lots of interaction, then we, we I, you know, there, there's an enhanced value there. But that is one of my goals here is, is to bring people with diverse backgrounds together and focus on the issue called efficiency. Exactly. And I'll add that, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, there's no exam with this course, because I know a lot of your other courses, there is an exam at the end, or the intent is to yeah. be able to pass that's the right. exam. Yeah, that's know, right. I'm going to say that. And that's one way that people feel more comfortable, because they don't have to worry that if they're watching a section and they can't do the calculations at the end of it, they're going to be tested. No, they can just say, I can watch that, right? And I can, you know, I can see what people are doing, and I can see it's a real calculation, but I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, so that there's virtue in not having an exam for that reason. Thank you for reminding me of that, Natalie. Yeah, no, that's a, I know, for myself not being a technical person, that's, that's a decision-making criteria for sure. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Daniel. Are there scholarships or other forms of financial support for the EMP course? Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll take that one. Um, there are a few ways that uh, you may be able to uh, get some uh, financial incentives. Certainly in Ontario, uh, we're lucky enough to have um, the EMP course because it is part of the, the dollars to cents family of courses that uh, that we run. Uh, there is uh, um, an incentive available through the Save on Energy program, ISO Save on Energy program. Natalie, maybe I can send you some more information. Oh. Uh, she's already got it up there. Um, so the other way is uh, through the Canada Job Grants. I know that a number of people have uh, been able to uh, secure those in order to take uh, this and other training as well. Uh, Natalie, I think you've just put in a link. Um, but what we do try and supply, and we try to update that as much as possible, is is, is a provincial list of what's available incentive-wise mm -hmm. uh, on our website. So hopefully um, you'll be able to find something there that you'll be able to um, uh, to get a hold of and, and be able to and use to, to take to, advantage to defray, of yeah, yeah to, to to take advantage and defray some of those costs. Yeah, and also I will say that a lot of uh, corporations or organizations offer professional development as well. So don't uh, remember to ask your employer as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So whereas you don't have an exam at the end, we do have a very nice looking certificate that you can hang on your wall. And it's funny, you think, you think, well, what's a certificate? Well, I actually had, when I was doing dollars and cents training, workshop very similar. So the guy sent me an email saying, I got a promotion to a job. I get to go to Australia because of the course that I took and the certificate you gave me. So this, you know, it, it may not seem important to us. Well, it is, but it can be very important to someone else. So, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Little but like just that. to be clear, Stephen, we're not saying that if you take the EMP course, you're going to get a trip to Australia. I was not really saying that. Saying you guys need a know, disclaimer on that one. <laughs> Karen out there. The other, the other group of people that we see coming in, uh, you might have mentioned this at the beginning. I might have missed it, Olivia. Was 
uh, also um, new graduates from programs in sustainability. Yes. And those people have a lot of knowledge, but they may not have some of the detailed technical knowledge. And this helps to sort of shore up that foundation. Um, so yeah, that's another group that, that I think would be very appealing. Yeah, and I, I was mentioning at the beginning, Stephen, that it, it's, it, and I mean, we know how important it is for that group in particular to have some, um, along with the, with obviously what they've learned theoretically in the different projects that, that people do throughout their, their either collegiate or university programs, but they also have some, some, uh, some real applied knowledge that they can demonstrate to employers right off the bat. I have, a, we have a number of questions here, so I'm just going to keep going. So we have a question here, um, from winner is I thought I should ask how this might be technical. How do you do the real time monitoring with the spreadsheet? Okay, I can take that question. There was a question there about screen sharing there, Natalie, if you can have a look at that one. But um, how do we do real time monitoring with spreadsheet? So you mean the on my computer? I guess that's the question I would ask. Maybe. Um, so I'm assuming the question is respect to to my um, little demonstration I did. So what I did here was I actually uh, used um, a, a panel meter, an energy you would see in a mechanical or an electrical room, right? And what I did was I built it into a little box and I, and I put an ethernet um, interface to it and I used Modbus to talk to it from the spreadsheet. There's like maybe 30 lines of code in a spreadsheet in VBA and I can actually pull the, all the information from that or all the data coming from that pumping demonstration. In fact, one of the versions I have actually has power factor, KVA, all those different things. And then I also have another port on the meter, which I can actually put a flow meter on too. So it, it hopefully that's the question that you're asking. How do I do the real-time monitoring with the spreadsheet? Can you confirm that, Natalie, with the person who asked the question? Yeah, well, actually, if you want to add, add it here. So, and then I'm just going to jump to another question because I think that was was the answer, but I can confirm with them. Is um, So Stephen, actually, so she doesn't say if this is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, are you the instructor for the next course yes i am <laughs> all right so you we'll, might we'll, we'll take it that that's a good thing <laughs> and I, I natalie i have to plug in that the the, the next course that Stephen will be teaching is is um uh from march 11th to, uh, from march 9th to march 11th so if that's a good thing yeah. then there yeah, you go actually, olivia will be there and the love like i um i have my son that will often help me out too to change things up and and what you see in terms of the way we discuss and dialogue here and interact today is the way we like to run our courses. Mm -hmm. It's not just about me talking head on the camera. No, it's more about a conversation. Yeah, Absolutely. and I've I've had um, uh, people tell me who have taken this course as well that it was it, like I just I'm teasing you, Stephen, but you do a fantastic job. And uh, they said that I, they were really concerned, especially it was at the beginning of the pandemic when you guys offered this course, and it was virtual. For, I think it was the first one. And they just came back to me and said it was, you know, I was very concerned about it being three days online. And they said it just flew by and it didn't feel like three days. So great job on on that. That was feedback that I was I was given. Um, Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, another question here is um, uh, how relevant is from Stephen? How relevant is the CEM training for ESC company? Okay, so you're asking me about the CEM training. How relevant is the CEM training for an E? What was the last an e ESC it's energy from, service company? Energy service yeah, company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, go, go ahead, ahead Stephen. No, go ahead, Stephen. Well, I guess it depends on your role, right? I think that the CEM training, like this, this training gives you foundation, but the CEM training, then you can do it, you know, you can do it with a gap with some practice in between, but it really allows the CEM training, I think, really allows you to know what you know, and, and the exam within it is important because it solidifies things for people. I mean, I know myself, I, I fear exams, but it's not, they're not bad things. I think they cause you to really come to grips with what you know at some point, right? And, and, and saying, in this course, we don't have it because it allows you to sort of watch, but ultimately you have to do that. So, and then the, if, if you're talking about an energy service company, I think all the stuff we talk about in here is really important. I actually used to work for an energy, one of the first energy service companies in this country years ago. So a lot of what I learned came out of that, that experience. But over the years, we've seen a lot of other people from ESCOs, if we can call them those, um, who, and, and the, what you have in the CEM, again, the financial analysis, like looking at energy from all points of view, the technical side of it, and, and even the organizational and, and, and individual side too, very important. So I, I would have to say, Olivia, I can flip it over to you. I don't teach the CEM, but I think it's an important part in that 
uh, learning pathway, as Olivier always likes to talk about. Yeah, that's true. I do. Uh, yeah, I'll just add that um, I, I I think that that the the CM really is is valuable for 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 two reasons. Um, the first is, yeah, to kind of reinforce that holistic view of energy efficiency, which is actually at the crux of what we what we try to present in the EMP 101 course, but also it is a validation um, of your skills and what you know, and it's something that we see a lot in, in as, as a requirement uh, more and more uh, now as, as, as we near about um, 4,500 or so CEMs across Canada. We, you, you see it as, as something that's necessary in certain projects or necessary um, uh, for certain, uh, in certain job descriptions and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's, it's definitely a, a valuable tool to have uh, in the toolbox for sure. Yeah, well, actually, I, would say, I would say that yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. I just noticed a question here from Joad Clement out in Alberta. I know he attended one of our courses and he's talking about um, the length of time of this course. Um, and I'm gonna go out and limb here. Um, so, um, Olivier, I mean, I, I, I sense this from people and we are breaking up some of our other courses into two, three, four hour sessions. So that may be something that we need to take back and think about whether it can be broken down. Olivier, do you wanna chime in on that one too? Yeah, I think that uh, that could be a possible, we haven't done that uh, down the road. So at the moment it's three days, they're consecutive days. Um, but there may be a possibility to split out the foundational systems and application in three different days. So Stephen, that's definitely something we can look at. Um, if the, um, if, the, if, if, if that's the way that people are more comfortable taking it, then by all means, I would actually in, encourage you to, uh, to write me a note. And uh, if that's the general consensus, we're, we're happy to look at that. We're, we're, we're definitely flexible on the approach. Perfect, that's good to know. I'm sure you're gonna get email, uh, inbox is gonna get inundated. Uh, two kind of related questions is, um, uh, Karen has a technical background, specifically in actually electrical and energy management. Uh, she, uh, wondering if, can I directly take the CEM certification as having two and a half years experience in power management? Olivier, that's your question. It is, yeah. Um, so. Actually, I would also invite her to get in contact with me uh, personally, and then I can give a bit more information about that offline as to what the requirements are in terms of uh, her experience. So maybe if she just wants to write me an email, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to her directly and I'll give her um, a little chart that, uh, that has all the, um, uh, the, the, the information about how your, um, how your degree uh, and also how your uh, experience will translate into the CEM. But in essence, there are essentially two levels for the CEM. For those that meet the criteria right off the bat, they can become uh, full-fledged CEMs right off the bat. And for those um, who uh, are still working towards that in terms of their, um, uh, in terms of their, their on-the-job experience, uh, then there's the EMIT, the Energy Manager in Training, that automatically um, becomes a CEM once they've uh, they've 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 hit that threshold of of. Um, of experience. So anyways, uh, send me a quick email and I'll, I'll definitely give you a more personalized response to that one. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting messages that some people can't see Stephen's screen anymore sharing. So if that's the case and you're wondering what Olivia's email address is, you can always email um, us at Efficiency Canada when you can connect you. So it's just info at efficiencycanada.org. Um, email email yeah, on our website. There you go. Hope I can see it, but some people are saying they can't. So I'm just uh, giving that as a, a second option, just so they're not left left out there wondering how to get in touch with you. Uh, a good a good question here is, um, what kind of opportunities are there to gain exposure to different roles in the energy efficiency industry? That's a good question. I uh, I would say not through this course because this is more so training and it's not like a a, a co-op. Um, so I can kind of uh, talk to this. There are different uh, training if you can reach to, like a summer student, if you are a student, that would be a, a great way to reach out to people. We actually have a list at Efficiency Canada of different training on our website. There's over 100 um, training uh, opportunities. This is one of them. It's listed there. Um, CIET offers a number of other courses, but there's also a lot of other organizations uh, out there, as well as universities and colleges that offer uh, training, so you can do a full degree or, or, or courses. So lots of, uh, I would uh, encourage you to take a look at that. I can put, um, once I get a second here, I can put the link to that in the, in the chat here so that you can have that as well. Um, and Natalie, all of that is true. I'll just add that we don't profile any particular 
uh, job or role directly. Um, but there are a number of, 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 uh, of, of things that we do reference that, that you will find in specific jobs. For instance, a lot of the foundational things an energy manager or a, um, a sustainability program manager, let's say for a municipality, would probably want or need to know a lot of the things on on uh, on the systems are the types of things that uh, that a building operator, for instance, might want to know. And then um, on on the application side, um, uh, on, on on day three, a lot of those things in terms of putting together a plan and so on and so forth, a lot of a lot of that will will involve um, program managers and uh, business development officers and things like that. So. Um, anyways, happy also, again, I think I put my email in there, but happy to answer any, any questions and help direct uh, that person uh, to any training that might be uh, valuable for um, whatever career path they've, they've set for themselves. That's perfect. Thanks for that. And I'm also adding, I added the training um, list that I, I mentioned earlier just in the chat there. I also added examples of jobs and energy efficiency. So there's about 12 jobs listed there that we highlight because um, it really, the range is really large. There's actually 436,000 Canadians working in energy efficiency and 51,000 uh, businesses. So there's a lot of us here, which is fantastic, but it's kind of overwhelming. So here's an idea of, of the different types of roles that pertain to energy efficiency on, on the our human energy uh, website. And we're also um, going to be updating that uh, this year with about 12 new jobs, so 24 in total, and then another uh, 12 over the next coming year. So 36 jobs of examples of uh, real people that work in energy efficiency that you can just, it gives you a, a great overview of the uh, jobs available. Um, another question here, just see, we have time for probably one or two, maybe one question. Um, a question here is what kind of, oh, no, sorry. If there was, if one has an electrical engineering background, does this course, oh, no, we already asked that one, sorry. I'm gonna go to David's question. It might be too technical, so if that's okay, yeah, we're just gonna end it. I'd like to take that one offline with David. Oh, okay, perfect, yeah, David can, uh, I saw that he put his email in the um, chat there. So I'm just gonna end it there for today because there was a lot of great discussion. So thanks everyone. And thanks for your interest in, in this course. And I, I would encourage anyone that's even thinking about it to reach out to Olivier to discuss or even just you know sign up. It's a fantastic intro course. There's no exam, so there is no pressure. You just take what, whatever you want um, from the course. Um, it's great for people that are new to the field or even have been in the field for 10 years, but not in a, a technical role, but are interested in learning more. Uh, I would say this course really applies to a, a, a wide variety of people. And I think that's why you guys created the course in the first place, just because so many people asked you about it. And um, so you, this is, this is your response to what people are asking for. So thank you for doing that for the sector. Uh, on behalf of 436,000 people, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I'm just going to, before we uh, end the call here, I'm just going to say if uh, our speakers next week, we actually have the Building Performance Institute of Europe. Uh, we have a speaker joining us. Um, I think she's she is a, I think she's Canadian or she definitely lived in Canada at some point in her life. Uh, so she is going to join us for that and talk about the um, renovation wave happening in Europe. So that would be a really interesting uh, topic. I'm really looking forward to that one to see what's happening over in the EU. Uh, so I hope you join us next uh, Friday at noon. And thanks again to Stephen and Olivier for joining us and have a fantastic Friday and I'll see you next week. 